Buenas tardes a todos, buenas tardes a todas. Estoy tratando de respirar hondo porque estoy un poquito emocionado de ver tanta gente aquí y tanta gente que está en el patio en este momento. Eh, es un momento de festejo, eh, de alguna manera estamos volviendo a nuestra facultad, a nuestro edificio, lo estamos nuevamente moviendo con, con nuestro propio latido, volviendo a estar presentes. Y es un momento de, de mucha emoción, para, seguramente para cada uno de ustedes, volver a entrar a la facultad, volver a estar aquí. Y además, volver a estar con un evento como, como este. ¿no? Siempre, siempre digo que uno, desde este lugar del que me toca ocupar, eh, lo que tiene que, que tener como principal eh, habilidad es tener la capacidad de poder escuchar y poder saber lo que lo que nuestra comunidad quiere, lo que nuestra comunidad necesita. Y en este momento no hay más que nombrar eh, a nuestro querido invitado de hoy y el interés que tuvo entre todos, especialmente nuestros y nuestras estudiantes que llenaron la facultad y que están llenando en este momento la obra magna, no es más que un motivo de, de enorme felicidad para mí y para todos nosotros. Eh, lo escuché a... Había que varias veces hablar de, de los sueños y de cómo, de cómo construirnos nuestros sueños y cómo ver concretados nuestros sueños. Y la verdad es que muchos de nosotros tenemos esa, esa misma línea, esas mismas ganas, cada uno de los que estamos aquí, cada uno de los que tenemos nuestra carrera profesional en esta facultad, es de alguna manera eso, los nuestros, los de nuestra comunidad, los de nuestras audiencias, pero en este caso en particular se produce otro fenómeno, que en todo caso los sueños de Viarque tiene la capacidad de convencernos de que son nuestros propios sueños también y que nosotros nos apropiamos de eso. Y eso tiene algo de mágico y es lo que hace que toda la gente que está aquí hoy y que está a, a, en el patio aquí, justo aquí arriba, también nos haya convocado para escucharlo y para tener esa sensación. La verdad es que todos los que eh, abrazamos estas disciplinas de proyecto, eh, lo que tenemos como objetivo es imaginar un futuro, proyectar algo que no existe hoy, que va a ex existir y ser construido en un futuro inmediato. Lo que nunca nadie nos dijo es cuál es la dimensión de ese futuro, cuán lejos puede ir nuestra mirada. Y bueno, a veces este, hay algunas personas que tienen la capacidad de ir un poco más lejos que uno o imaginar un futuro que uno es incapaz de imaginar. Así que me parece que yo estoy acá sentado con, con esta expectativa, o sentado, o me voy a estar sentado en unos minutos más, con esa expectativa, con escuchar a alguien que imagina un futuro y que es capaz de contarlo, como lo cuenta nuestro querido invitado, Bjarke Ingels. Por favor. But but it's um it's it's a great uh, it's it's very exciting to be here for uh, for uh, many different reasons. Um, I think one of the first times I came to Buenos Aires, um, I ended up having uh, spontaneously I ended up at a dinner at uh, uh, Francis Malman's place where he was cooking for uh, Bono and, uh, and and the Edge uh, because U2 was uh, was visiting town. So I, I ended up leaving Buenos Aires feeling that it was probably one of the coolest places I'd, I'd ever been to. Uh, and then, um, and then the, this, the, the last time I was here was actually in February 2020, um, uh, visiting some, uh, some dear friends. And, and pretty much since then, the school has been closed. Uh, and, uh, and I understand now this is almost like a pre-opening For, for everybody coming back in April. So I, I, I feel like saying, welcome back. <laughs> but, um, but then I'm also, I'm also here because um, uh, we've been working for some years on a project in, um, in Berlin uh, called Monopole, Monopole for the People. And, um, and, and we are uh, with, a, with the same group of collaborators and, and a whole series of, of new collaborators here in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, 
uh, starting up uh, Monopole Buenos Aires in uh, Calle Darwin. Uh, and, um, and essentially, uh, we are here to, to try to see if we can uh, gather uh, all of the sort of uh, energy and, and talent and, and creativity that, uh, that, we, that we feel is here in the city. So, uh, so, so I invite you, um, when, when you go home tonight or tomorrow, to, to check out this is the, the Instagram account. Uh, there's also a, a website, and, uh, and it's in Calle Darwin, named after my son, Darwin. Uh, so uh, you, you are all invited. And, um, and on that note, um, I, w I was thinking to, to spend the next uh, hour and maybe 15 minutes to, to take you through sort of um, a series of ideas that have been growing within our practice for the last uh, 20 years. And, and, and maybe first of all is this idea to invite you to think about architecture and design, not as a question of style or taste, but um, uh, the Danish word for design is form giving, uh, And it literally means form giving, uh, uh, because it means to give form to that which has not yet been given form. Uh, in other words, it means that as designers, as form givers, we have the power and the possibility to give form to the future, to give form to the world that we're gonna live in in the future. And when you think about it like that, suddenly design and architecture becomes maybe one of the most fundamental things we can do as human beings. Imagine the world we would like to live in and then uh, make it so. And, uh, and that journey, the first project we uh, designed more than 20 years ago, uh, was the Copenhagen Harbor Bath. Uh, we also designed the one in Aarhus. And, and it's essentially sort of is a celebration of the fact that the port of Copenhagen had become so clean that you could swim in it. So you didn't have to drive for hours to get to uh, uh, Punta del Este. You could basically jump in the port in the middle of downtown uh, Copenhagen. And, um, and that made me think that maybe there's something fundamental. Maybe a clean port is not only nice for the fish. A sustainable city is not only good for the environment, it's also much better for the people living in it. And, and we call this idea hedonistic sustainability, that the sustainable city or the sustainable uh, building is not only right for the environment, it's also much more fun for the people living in it. Uh, we took the idea to uh, a bigger scale, uh, in 2019, we opened uh, the Copenhagen, uh, uh, the Copen Hill. It's um, essentially a, a waste to energy power plant that converts the waste of Copenhagen into district heating and, and electricity. Uh, but it's also the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. There are no toxins coming out of the chimney, so we could turn the facade of the building into um, the tallest climbing wall in the world. Uh, Denmark is a country that has no mountains. Uh, we have to uh, do them ourselves. Um, you can also journey up inside the, the power plant where you have all the technology that turns the waste of Copenhagen into electricity and district heating and uh, it extracts all the toxins. So as you journey up through this uh, factory space that is uh, bathed in daylight, you arrive uh, on the roof where we have created um, an alpine landscape um, the steam that comes out of the chimney is actually cleaner than the air you breathe in, uh, uh, in Copenhagen. Um, we don't have mountains in Copenhagen, but, but if we did, this is what they would look like. Uh, it's essentially all of the um, indigenous plants that you would normally call weeds uh, that, um, that are growing there. Uh, we opened in 2019 and we had planted uh, around 60 different species. And, and we counted them uh, recently, and there was like uh, more than 120. So in just two years, the biodiversity of the, of the mountain had, had doubled. And, and then maybe most importantly, um, at the um, Winter Olympics in Sochi, uh, Denmark won zero medals. Uh, and uh, it is my ambition that we can change this, because at least now the Copenhageners can, uh, can ski uh, all year uh, uh, at home uh, on a power plant uh, that turns the waste of the city into uh, a resource. Um, so, so that's essentially the sort of the, the, the birth of this idea of, um, 
of hedonistic sustainability. Um, you can say hedonistic sustainability is what you could call an oxymoron. It's, it's an idea or a concept that seems to combine seemingly opposite uh, elements into a new hybrid or a new idea. Uh, and I think uh, in a lot of our work, there is this oxymoronic tension that you take things that seem to be separate and, and you combine them into something new. Uh, um, one example of such a hybrid entity is a museum we designed and built in, in a sculpture park in Norway. And it's, uh, it's essentially part of the, the sculpture park. And we thought, instead of making the building a separate experience, it's actually the way you get from one side of the river over to the other. So the, um, the gallery is a, is a bridge halfway over the river. It changes proportions from a vertical uh, sort of artificially lit space to a horizontal sort of panoramic space. Um, it's entirely made out of standard elements. You can see all the pieces are straight extruded uh, aluminum uh, on the outside. And inside, it's basically white painted wooden two by fours so it's essentially the same material that any building in Norway is, is made out of. But the way it's put together, it creates the sensation of warped surfaces or twisting spaces or, or, or curves. But when you look closely, you can see that every member is actually straight. So, so in that sense, it's, it's almost the art and science of, of creating something extraordinary out of something ordinary. Take uh, an everyday material like a two by four and uh, and use it in a, in a different way. And that, that's essentially the power of design, that you can, the way you put things together makes them to something they are not uh, uh, ordinarily. So it is essentially uh, a museum that is also a bridge that is also uh, a sculpture in a sculpture park. And another sort of aspect that has interested me in in, uh, in architecture is that today we've become so used to the kind of divorce between hardware and, and software, between form and content, that um, uh, you know, an iPhone and, and even a Samsung Galaxy looks the same. The hardware is just basically a, a black rectangle and it's the software that makes it into something. So almost as if the physical part becomes more and more irrelevant, and it's the immaterial part that, that matters. Um, but, but in architecture, somehow, the hardware is the software. It is the sequence of spaces that, uh, that sort of opens up or, uh, or, or moves you through or, or creates a, uh, an uplifting experience or an enclosing experience. And, and, and one example, we, um, uh, some like five, five, six years ago, I was invited to come to Le Brassu, in um, uh, Valley de Joux in, um, in Switzerland. It's the cradle of watchmaking. And, um, and we were invited to, um, to uh, design the, the museum of, of watchmaking. And, and I had never had a watch, uh, or at least not since I had a, a phone. Um, so I, you know, I was curious, but I didn't have a lot of knowledge about, uh, about watchmaking. Um, and then I go and I meet this master watchmaker from uh, Galicia. And uh, the only uh, language we had in common was, uh, was Spanish. So it was a, a slightly tortured conversation. But, but um, he ends up sort of explaining, uh, you know, that you know, it's the resource spiral. The spiral is a, a piece of coiled metal. And the geometry allows it to store kinetic energy. The, the, the anchor in the watch that uh, swings around when you move your hand it, uh, it moves around and it winds up the kinetic energy and stores it in the, in the spiral. And you have the, um, the regulator or the um, escapement that takes that kinetic energy that you've stored or that has been harvested from your body and it releases it in a regular quantum that allows you to gear it up and down to tell the time or the moon phases or, or whatever else you can do with a, uh, with a watch. Um, and, and even sort of he, he, he demonstrated how you make a, a bell. And he took a piece of metal and he burned it with a, a little flamethrower. Uh, and then he had a list of colors. And when it had this particular shade of purple, he sort of froze it and then 
because of the molecular structure of the metal at that temperature, it started sounding like what he was looking for. So, so essentially, it was just, it dawned to me that maybe, maybe Swiss watchmaking is one of the last disciplines in the world where the form is the content aside from, uh, aside from architecture. So, so we tried to sort of design a, a building that would have the same principle. So they wanted a chronological uh, journey through the history of watchmaking. Uh, and we coiled it into a double spiral uh, that we placed in the landscape uh, adjacent to the historical buildings. So you can sort of, uh, you arrive, you journey to the center, and then you sort of expand again and, and go into the historical uh, building. So here you see it in, uh, uh, in the, it's on the edge of the Jura Mountains. And as you sort of journey into the building, of course the building becomes almost like a piece of the landscape rather than, than a building that competes with the, with the neighbors. The arrival sort of happens from inside the existing headquarters. It sort of wraps around the, the old building that, uh, that sits there in the first place. And then you have this kind of journey through the, the different elements and it's almost like a, a skeletonized uh, watch where all the solid parts have been removed away and you see the pure mechanism, of course, of the timepieces, but also the pure mechanism of the, of the architecture. You can look over the shoulder of the master watchmakers. Uh, they're sitting facing north like they've been doing for centuries. And, and when you look in the middle, uh, you have all of the different sort of complications of watchmaking uh, on display. You can see that one thing is missing, there, there are no walls. Um, the entire roof is resting on the glass. Uh, and that's actually because glass is stronger than steel when it comes to compression. It's just not very good at, um, when there's an earthquake, glass tends to buckle and break. Uh, but because of the curvature of the glass, the curve or the arc resists uh, vibrations and, and therefore the curvature actually allows us to to carry the entire roof on, uh, on the glass walls uh, alone. So it's again this idea that the form of the glass gives it a different attribute uh, than it would have it were, if it was just a, a normal straight piece. And then sort of adjacent to, um, to the museum, they invited us to design a, a small hotel, uh, 56 Keys, where people could come and experience uh, the valley uh, and the whole culture of uh, uh, the, the cradle of, of watchmaking. And um, um, the valley is covered in snow six months of the year. It's part of the longest uh, cross-country ski slope. So we designed a hotel where you can actually ski in and ski out from every single room and from the restaurant, from the spa, from the lobby. So the, the architecture becomes like a natural extension of the, uh, of the valley itself. So in a way, two buildings that are designed, of course, for the same, for the same client, but somehow because of their program, they, they end up producing uh, quite, different, uh, quite different architectures. Essentially inside, it's, it's really the full immersion into the valley that becomes the, uh, the main experience. And another sort of aspect that we have picked up over the, the last years is, is an approach to creativity uh, that is systematic. It's, it's a word that we've taken from, um, from our friends at Lego. Um, Le Lego is, um, actually this is one of my favorite photos. It's uh, all the richest people in Denmark and me. Um, and it's basically because the family that makes Lego uh, is the richest uh, family in Denmark. I think it says something about a country if your greatest industry is Lego. Uh, but um, they, they, um, they uh, so this is the foundation stones. They invited us to design the, the home of the brick. Uh, and this is of course the architectural model. Uh, for your information, a Lego man is uh, one to 50. Uh, and I have pretty much the proportions of a, of a Lego man. Um, also, Le Lego is a country that has succeeded in, uh, in making everybody think that Lego is from their home country, when it is, in fact, from my home country. Uh, but um, So here you see the, the museum uh, as built. Uh, the idea is that 
the entire, we tried to create an architecture that would be as inviting and as engaging as, as Lego is itself. So uh, the roof is a series of public playgrounds that are connected. So anyone without a ticket is welcome to roam around the roof uh, uh, for free as they, as they want. Um, uh, you can also enter uh, in all four corners. It's open to the public and there's a, a big public square. The cobblestone turns into wooden cobblestones. Uh, the citizens of Bilon can roam around uh, for free again. Uh, and then, of course, you can choose to enter up into the, into the galleries. Um, uh, and it might be one of the few museums in the world where you are actually invited to touch all the exhibits. Um, but I think one of the things that I like about systematic creativity, it's another oxymoron that being systematic and being creative is seen, sometimes seen as, as mutually exclusive. But it is actually in the creation of a, of a system that Lego becomes not a toy, but a tool. A tool that empowers the child to create his or her own world and tend to inhabit that world through play and to invite her friends in joining her in inhabiting that world and, and co-creating that world. So, um, and I think that's essentially what architecture and form giving is all about is that as, as human beings we have the power to imagine and create our own world and co-create it and invite others to to join us in inhabiting and and creating that world um, an, another sort of oxymoron is the idea of of social uh, social infrastructure um, I think um, of course the waste to energy power plant is a piece of energy infrastructure or waste management infrastructure that has been given uh, uh, positive social side effects. Um, in, in the port of, uh, of Aarhus, the second largest city in, 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 in Denmark, we were invited to uh, master plan one of the islands in, in the old port. And uh, because it's waterfront, um, there's a lot of real estate value that, and it's, it quickly becomes all about putting a lot of apartments that have water views, so you can sell them as expensively as possible. And then the waterfront tends to end up being this kind of linear promenade, and then the apartments right in front to capture the, the economic value. But we thought it's actually more difficult to create life. What if we start by, by focusing on life? And what if the promenade is not just this polite uh, passage along the edge, but the, the, the public space moves into the water and back into land and back into the water. So creating a, a harbor bath, a beach, uh, a theater, putting a, a series of like little, um, uh, little kind of beach houses, uh, little restaurants, sort of, so that from day one, before we build a single apartment, we've already created a very lively uh, uh, urban space. And then all the buildings follow after. So in a way, the the apartments, the buildings have to, are shaped by the public space or by the life, not the other way around, that the life is shaped uh, by the buildings. Um, so the, the Aarhus Harbor Bath, which is like the, the second one of its kind we've, uh, we've designed, uh, the, first, the first building we built, we actually built it at the end of the pier, um, a series of... Uh, of homes with, uh, with terraces surrounding a central courtyard. Uh, right in front of them, also a bit, a bit sort of unusual, stealing the view from, uh, from the building, we put these little uh, mini homes. Uh, they, are, they are privately owned, but if you buy one of them, you commit to making four events per year. And, uh, and with like uh, roughly 60 of them, you pretty much have uh, one kind of different uh, uh, event uh, uh, every day that is organized by the, by the, by the people living there. This is actually uh, the Aarhus Church. They bought these two ones, and, uh, and we own this one. So if you come to, to Aarhus, you should rent it for the night. It's on Airbnb. Uh, but, but essentially, it's this strange human scale that you, you suddenly wedge into the city. It's, uh, you have this kind of bizarre life. You, uh, you, uh, you live... Uh, right out to where, where people are walking. Uh, they're like mass timber huts uh, made in a factory and, uh, and placed there. But, but essentially a, a, an attempt to mix the scales. So just because we are in, in the city, we don't have to um, 
all the buildings don't have to have the same scale. Uh, and the last, um, uh, last piece of the puzzle is, is, a, is a hotel uh, that, that we're building where the, the promenade is extended, uh, of course, inside uh, the, the foyer. Uh, but also on the outside, it becomes a kind of ziggurat where you can walk uh, and climb uh, all the way to the, uh, the tip of the hotel. You have a spa uh, uh, with baths overlooking the city. Um, but maybe more interestingly, you can sort of uh, literally walk along the hotel suites uh, all the way to, uh, uh, to the top. So, so again, like an, 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 like an attempt to use the buildings to not occupy the public space, but actually to enable and accommodate and lift up the, the public space. Um, another example of this is in, um, in, in Oakland. Uh, we got invited by a, um, a baseball team, the Oakland A's, to create, create their new uh, ballpark. And, 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 a, and a baseball stadium is called a ballpark because it started play, being that people were playing ball in the park. And then at some point, some guy gets the idea to put a fence around it and, and, and charge tickets. Uh, uh, but we thought, what if we could bring the park back into the ballpark? Um, to consider the, the ballpark, the city park of a new neighborhood. So extending the, the streets of, uh, of Oakland uh, down to the water, wrap them around the, the park. Um, because baseball is an asymmetric sport, it has an outfield, we can actually uh, push the, uh, the ballpark down and kiss the ground, uh, allowing people to, uh, to enter simply by walking across the field. You get this kind of high line of baseball where you have a public park uh, where all of the, uh, the, the clubhouses and the, and the restaurants and the different concessions and bars extend out. It also means that the seats that are the furthest away from the game, normally the worst seats, become park seats. So they might be, you know, a baseball game can take four to five hours, so it's actually nice to be in a park uh, uh, once in a while. Uh, but then imagine this is on roughly 89 uh, days per year when there's a game. But then on the other 250 days, it's just the park of, of this neighborhood in Oakland. So a normal day, and on a game day. So instead of creating this monument that is empty all the time, it just becomes a natural extension and a sort of uplifting of the public realm of, uh, uh, of Oakland. So in this, is, in this case, like um, a piece of infrastructure for sports that has this positive social side effect on, on the surrounding city. Also, we've spent the last, um, I mean, of course, because of the pandemic, there's been a lot of thinking going on uh, about uh, the future of the work environment. Um, I think in the first month of, of lockdown, uh, Twitter announced that they were never coming back to the office. Uh, I think they might uh, regret that by now. But um, we've been spending the last five, six years working with Google on trying to uh, understand the organizational architecture of Google and turn that into a physical architecture. So Google has studios of four that become teams of 25, that becomes neighborhoods of 150, that becomes communities of up to 500. And, and in the first of four buildings total we've uh, uh, built for them by now, we had to accommodate a town of, of 3,000 people. Uh, but then typically you have all the support functions, the meeting rooms, the restaurants, the cafeteria, the uh, auditoria, the technical spaces that clutter the floor plate and break up the con continuity. So we sort of put them on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a second level. And then we organize all of the work environment in 20 platforms of 150 people. And we open up between them so you can connect to the more active, uh, busy places be beneath, almost like having squares in a city. Uh, and then um, in each of these courtyards where you can connect from the busy ground floor to the more sort of focused, contemplative uh, upper floor, uh, we place a column that carries this kind of solar canopy. Uh, so the entire facade of the building is either turning uh, light into power or allowing the light to come in to, um, 
to illuminate uh, the workspaces. So this was one of the first sort of uh, illustrations. The canopy extends uh, beyond to shade the glass, and you can see that this kind of layered uh, organization. Um, it's the simplest, most blatant uh, uh, sort of structure. It's a catenary uh, sort of tensile uh, grid shell. Uh, the underside is actually expressed. So by, by expressing the forces of hanging, you minimize the, uh, the use of steel. Uh, and then by having these um, uh, smiles uh, between the different sheets, we can actually let in the perfect amount of, uh, of, of daylight. So you can see like an incredibly honest structure where everything is just off the shelf elements that have been put together in a, in a simple way. Um, the entire facade material is a special photovoltaic product we found where the glass is textured in this kind of sinus curve so it actually captures the light that wants to bounce back. So instead of being reflective, it looks more um, matte. It actually increases the performance of the, of the photovoltaic, but it also makes it more, more beautiful. Um, so you can say every single surface of this building either accepts the daylight or turns it into uh, to electricity. And so you end up having, you can see the hangars of the Moffett Airfield, NASA, in the background, uh, and, and the workspace of Google in the foreground. So, so inside, you have this kind of 20 platforms that kiss. And you can see that each platform is lifted the height of a desk from its neighbor. So even if you're sitting in the middle, you can look out. Um, between them, you have the, the courtyards. Each of the tables is made out of uh, mass timber. Um, so you have this kind of warmth and, and friendliness of the, uh, of the wood uh, before you ascend up into the work environment uh, above. So they're about to move in in the, in the next month, uh, and, and happily uh, Google is going back to, uh, to, to working in situ, so uh, the buildings won't be, uh, won't be empty. But, but essentially, you can say an, almost an experiment to work very closely with Google and, and really tailor the architecture to the way that Google is organized as a, uh, as a company. So then like right before the, um, the pandemic, um, or it's actually three years ago, we, uh, we met, uh, I had a meeting with uh, Akio-san, the, the president uh, his name is Akio Toyota, and, and he is the great-grandchild of the founder of the Toyota company. And, and he told me a story uh, that Toyota used to be a loom manufacturer, uh, making very large uh, machines for the textile industry. Uh, and because they were so good at making large, complex machines, when the automobile got invented, they were the best at making large machines, so they started and, and became the the biggest car maker in the world. They also created the first uh, uh, hybrid car. Um, and of course now I'm moving into various kinds of electric cars, personal mobility of various kinds, and mobility as a service. Um, and, and he basically revealed to us that he thought just like Toyota had pivoted from making looms into making cars, once again they had to pivot from making cars into providing mobility as a service. And to be able to do that, they needed some, uh, some kind of a experimentarium, a living, working, urban laboratory where they could test how to inhabit a city. And we, with Toyota, we started analyzing, and we ended up sort of thinking that maybe a city, maybe each street doesn't have to do the same. There could be vehicular roads with electric and autonomous cars. There could be promenades where you have shared mobility and personal mobility, and there could be parks uh, where you can only walk. Uh, and you can imagine if you take those three kinds of streets in a principle of repeating them every three streets, you get this kind of grid where the different uh, grids weave together, and that means that you can get to every city block moving only with a car or riding only a bicycle or walking only through um, 
a park. And, uh, and that essentially became uh, the logic of the, of the woven city. Um, you can say that the, the, the street today tries to do everything, but therefore fails at almost everything because everything is dominated by the cars. So we said every third street is really electric vehicles and, and people. Then you have bikes, scooters, and people on the promenades, and then you have parks. And then by weaving them together in, in, in both directions of the city, you can walk from anywhere to anywhere through the park, bike from anywhere to anywhere through the promenade, or get an, an autonomous vehicle from anywhere to anywhere uh, on, the, on the streets. Um, and then, of course, since we are making a city, we can harvest energy from the sun, we can use renewable uh, materials. And, and in the space between the buildings, Toyota and the different collaborators can sort of examine how the different kinds of movement can be orchestrated in the most seamless uh, possible way. Uh, underneath, you have a matter net that delivers goods straight to people's homes. You have fuel cell technology that uses hydrogen as a renewable energy source to power the whole uh, city. And inside the homes, apart from beautiful views of Mount Fuji, you have domestic robots of various kinds that support, in this case, the aging uh, population of, um, of Japan and eventually the world. So, so it's essentially it's a, it's a living, working laboratory where they, in, an, in a real environment with 5,000 people working and 2,000 people living, can, can test uh, how to sort of best accommodate our future. And, and what I really like is that it's a car maker that asked us to design this city. And uh, we took two thirds of the space that is normally reserved for cars and gave it over to more interesting forms of, of city life, uh, as well as plant life, uh, animal life, and, uh, and human life. So, so phase one broke ground in, in, in 2020 and should open in a year. And, and, and they remain committed to, to realizing this experiment. And you can say, even though it's a purpose designed city, the idea is to develop principles that we can apply in existing cities um, uh, that might actually free up not just the space of the woven city, but, but spaces of all cities to become sort of more accommodating to, to more exciting forms of, uh, uh, of life. Then I've been spending the last 12 years of my life in, um, in New York. And, um, and shortly after I moved there, uh, Hurricane Sandy came and shut down uh, all of lower Manhattan for, for weeks. Um, and as a result, we found ourselves invited for a competition to imagine the flood protection for lower Manhattan. Uh, and we asked ourselves, could we imagine a way to protect the city that wouldn't incarcerate the life of the city from the water around it? And, and we got inspired by the High Line. Uh, the High Line is essentially a piece of infrastructure, old train tracks, that after they shut the trains down, have become one of the most popular parks in the city. So we thought, what if we could actually take the resiliency infrastructure of uh, Lower Manhattan uh, and make it nice before it shuts down? Could we design it with other programs uh, to make it lively and inviting and accommodating? So um, we reached out to all of the different uh, neighborhoods, all of the different communities that live uh, uh, along the waterfront of Manhattan and with them, uh, we, we brainstormed what, what were the things they would want to do under the FDR highway. We could create these kind of different kinds of furniture and planters. Uh, we could have these kind of deployable uh, art walls that could come down and, and, and shut off the, uh, the city. Where you have more space, we could create rolling hills uh, that would protect uh, not only the, uh, the park from the noise of the highway, uh, but will also protect the city from uh, uh, incoming uh, storm surges. Um, so essentially, sort of moving along the waterfront of Manhattan, we found ways to make uh, the waterfront of Manhattan not only more resilient and, and safe, but also make it more enjoyable and more accessible to the life uh, of the people uh, living in it. So. Um, 
we just broke ground um, in the beginning of the pandemic, actually, of, of this project. Uh, um, we're doing the entire east portion of uh, the dry line, uh, as we've called it, the high line that's going to keep Manhattan dry. Um, and, and I think I, I see it as the sort of ultimate uh, example of, of what you could call a, a social infrastructure. Um, and, and this sort of reality of not just New York, but all waterfront cities in the world, including Buenos Aires, but also entire nations like French Polynesia uh, or the Maldives uh, are looking at, at potentially disappearing into the water in the next uh, decades. You have various examples of cities that are beginning to embrace the water in, in various ways. Um, but also, every day in the world, you have two to three million people uh, living on the water in the offshore and shipping industry. Um, so we partnered with a, with a company called Oceanics to see if we could design a city from scratch uh, that would be based on the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations and that would be entirely floating. Um, that means that all of the energy has to be locally sourced from renewable elements, uh, wind, waves, uh, uh, solar, uh, anaerobic digesters. Uh, all of the water needs to be harvested from, through desalination or rainwater capture or dehumidification. Uh, the food has to be grown and sourced locally. That means that we had to forget about dairy because you can't have beef and milk when you only have too little space. So you would have to export it uh, and or import it. And then you have like all the waste needs to be dealt with uh, locally as well. Um, and you can say like normally when you uh, design an urban master plan, like with the Woven City, you, you think about the roads and how to get there and then you put the, the buildings in place. In this case, we simply started by sort of looking at all of the renewable energy sources uh, that we would have and, and try to basically create a man-made ecosystem that channels the flow of resources through this, this complex reality. Uh, it's essentially uh, an archipelago of city blocks. Uh, each uh, city block uh, is a hexagon with uh, uh, 75 meter sides. They can be built, uh, prefabricated, and, and, and moved to their location and, and connected to others. We created a, a kind of family of, uh, of plugins that could create, make each island unique, even if they're all based on the, on the hexagon. Uh, farming has to be distributed so that each block has an element of food production. Uh, you have uh, solar panels maximizing shade and, and, and the roof area. We're using only light materials to minimize like, or in, uh, enhance the buoyancy. Uh, wood and, and bamboo, uh, any architecture, of course, uh, within that, that logic. Uh, and then below in the pontoons, you have the backup infrastructure for, for energy, uh, for water retention, for uh, waste management, and for, uh, for food production. So, so you can almost see it as this kind of vertical journey. Above, you have uh, like vertical farms, uh, you have uh, aeroponics, uh, aquaponics, you have ocean farming uh, below the, the pontoons, and finally, bio-rock reefs uh, uh, attaching the, the structures to the, to the seabed. So this is a city block of 300 people forming a larger block of, uh, of 1,500 people and, and a total little town of, of 10,000 residents. And, and just to give you an idea, this is uh, Manhattan. Um, and, and you can imagine, because of the organic nature of this, almost like a a little culture or community, it can grow uh, and become uh, uh, a real sort of floating metropolis if, uh, if need be. So, so here you see the, um, our sort of first vision. Uh, we're now partnering with uh, the city of Busan uh, to um, design and build the first three uh, uh, floating uh, city blocks in, uh, in, in the port of, of Busan. But essentially here you are in the main town square um, it also has this amazing, this is like the, uh, the sort of um, polyculture 
um, permaculture gardens that are both recreative areas, but also uh, 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 an actual part of the food production. You have sea farming uh, uh, below. Uh, the fish market. And then, of course, it's culturally agnostic. You can imagine the pontoons are essentially just man-made land, but the architecture that goes on top can, of course, adapt uh, to, uh, to any sort of specific local climate or, uh, or culture. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so we hope with, um, with the first projects in, in, in Busan to develop the, um, the technology as a, uh, as a viable uh, and sort of economically feasible uh, uh, response because, of course, right now, it's, it's not very necessary, but, but even if we would go fully sustainable uh, overnight, um, the temperature rises uh, means that probably a lot of the island nations will disappear. And, and when that happens in, in decades from now, it would be amazing if we had already developed the, the kind of technology and infrastructure that would allow them to, 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 to stay where they are, but basically move on to uh, uh, a floating form of urbanism. And, and that, that brings me to sort of the, um, the kind of last major subject that I would like to, um, to talk about tonight, which is, um, uh, which is climate change and our response or lack of response, uh, uh, but also very possible response to climate change. Um, we, we have offices in, in, in four different uh, cities, uh, New York, Copenhagen, uh, London, and, and Barcelona. Um, and this is what our workplace looks like until two years ago when it suddenly looked like, like this. And, and in the first kind of couple of weeks, we found out that our model workshop could be converted into making uh, emergency medical equipment to the hospitals in New York and, and London and, and, and Barcelona that were falling short of simple things like face shields and, and and tubes for, for ventilators. So it became kind of interesting that suddenly for six weeks inside our own company, we had the tools and the skills to address the most important issue uh, in the world at that time, which was medical uh, emergency equipment. Um, so if you say normally our range uh, of scale goes from a single building to a, a regional master plan, we could actually make smaller things that had a greater impact. We thought, what, what if we can actually address the biggest uh, challenge, apply architectural thinking at the scale of, uh, of our planet, so to make a master plan for planet Earth. Um, and, and, and in a way, it's because you can say uh, scientists are very good at scientific accountability and, and explaining a problem, um, but, they're, but they're maybe not always entrepreneurs. Uh, they're maybe more academics. And, and politicians have a four-year election cycle, which means that anything in 2050 is not really going to uh, matter for their re-election. Um, and, uh, and activists are good at calling attention to an issue, but they might not be uh, equipped to solve it. And we thought, Maybe as architects, we can make, we can collect input from a lot of different people, experts, and uh, and, and we can put it into uh, a, pr a pragmatic utopian master plan. We thought like, this is Earth. Our current energy bill is 158,800 terawatt hours per year. Um, our, our sort of economic. Uh, Development over the last 200 years has been powered by fossil fuels. You can see 200 years ago, we were only burning wood. And then came coal, crude oil, and natural gas, and, and a little bit of nuclear and some renewables. But, but essentially, this incredible explosion powered by fossil fuels has also decreased uh, child mortality, increased life expectancy, increased dis distribution of wealth, lowered uh, the amount of people living in, in extreme poverty, 
uh, created more equality uh, among the gender and the different cultures. So it's done a lot of good things, but it's also had some negative side effects. Maybe also, if you look at the amount of uh, renewables, it's interesting that actually most of them is burning wood still. Um, so the, you know, essentially all the other renewables is a small fraction of, of, of burning uh, uh, biomass. And, and when you look at, at the source of climate change, 75% comes from, uh, from, um, from CO2, 14% from, uh, from methane, which is mostly from agriculture, the nitrous oxide and, and F gases. Um, here you can see that despite our awareness of the situation, uh, since 1990, every single sector, and for instance, this is the, um, this is the, the energy sector, electricity and heat, Every single sector has actually uh, gone up in, instead of going down. Um, if you look at the problem in another way, you see all the different uh, sort of verticals, transportation and you see electricity is the biggest one, and you can see what kind of greenhouse gas they end up producing. Um, if you look at it by source, you can see China is by far the biggest contributor to um, global warming. But if you look at the last 200 years, you, you realize that actually the West has contributed uh, the most. Um, so we thought, like, let's look at all of Earth within five different verticals that relate to greenhouse gas emissions. So essentially, energy, food, industry, transportation, uh, waste and resources. And then another five that are not related to climate change, but to the environment in general. So biodiversity, pollution of plastics in the oceans or particles in the air, access to water, uh, human health, and, and the, way we, uh, the way we live. Um, and each of those verticals are somehow interconnected. Uh, and you can say the solution of one trickles into, into the other. Um, and maybe also, like today, our, since we started the work, our energy bill has gone up. Uh, but by 2050, we're going to be 10 billion people, and we should all have access to the same quality of life. So we said everybody should have the same quality of life as Denmark or Singapore. So that means that we actually have to solve a much harder problem. Um, one of the sort of good news is that if you look at almost all um, renewable energy sources, except uh, hydroelectricity and geothermal, they have actually uh, gone down in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in price. Um, if you would cover all of the energy uh, bill of Earth with, um, with wind power, this is all of the amount of offshore wind you actually need. So, so there's definitely space for it. This is where you can, can do it uh, in the red zones, uh, basically to the north and the south is where you have the most wind resource. With solar, you can do it in an even smaller uh, area uh, where, the, it's the, where it's the brightest. And, and the cool thing about solar is that the cost per watt has gone down steadily since the, uh, since the dawn of photovoltaics, which means that you can actually now, it used to be that you would always place the panels to the south, but if you place them east-west, you can double the amount of energy production uh, and, um, and, and actually even out the, the, the curve. Uh, so that means that you actually only need the, the small uh, orange square. The problem then becomes, this is a graph that shows you in yellow the solar output and in blue the wind output of the UK in January. And this is the same graph in June. So you can see like in June you have long days with sun and almost no wind. Uh, in January you have a lot of wind but almost no, uh, no sun. So intermittence is, is the problem. You have almost like a blue valley and a, and a yellow peak. Um, of course, you can use energy storage uh, uh, of various kinds. Um, but also today, this is the map of how we move energy through the world in the form of oil, gas, and coal. Um, and this is a map of which regions in the world are connected with a power grid. Uh, 
so if you imagine a series of regional projects that would connect the, the different uh, grids to, together, you could actually turn all of Earth into uh, a single grid. And, and that means that if you connect uh, London, uh, this is the solar output through the year from, uh, from London. You can see a peak over the, the, northern, the, the northern summer. And this is from Cape Town. Uh, if you combine the two, you have a perfectly even uh, uh, power output. If you connect, of course, east and west, the peak uh, of, of midday also is, is existing somewhere all the time. And finally, different locations in a kind of vertical slice of, of Earth, uh, measuring wind output. So the, the wind is always blowing somewhere. So in many ways, this kind of interconnectivity that bridges the seasonal cycle, cycle north to south and the daily cycle east to west could actually be undone if we would connect uh, uh, us all into a, a single power grid. But then, of course, like, this can become a very long um, a sort of a, a lecture on, on, on global systems. But we thought, what if there was a way to, to boil this down to something we can really relate to? So this is one Earthling. And there's 10 billion uh, of, uh, of us. So we thought, like, what, what, is, what is 10 billion people or 10 billion Earthlings if we would all go to the same concert? Um, this is 100, this is 10,000, uh, and then essentially we could, all of Earth could go to a concert in an area of 10 by 10 uh, kilometers. Um, how much space do we have available if, if we're not at a concert, but we, we divide all of Earth uh, between us? If you divide Earth into uh, 10 billions, uh, each of us will have 238 by 238 meters. That's your individual share of, of all of Earth. You can see the Earthling, she's still there, she's just a lot smaller. Um, and 71% and of your share of Earth is ocean, uh, and 9% is basically glaciers and barren land that is uninhabitable. Uh, and of the rest, half is nature, and the other half is used for agriculture with a tiny bit of sea. So uh, this is how much we have to live from uh, if we don't uh, want to expand into any more uh, uh, nature. Actually, today, you expand two to three square meters into your nature half uh, every year, and we should stop that. But, but this is basically what we have, uh, and you basically have, um, all our emissions are coming from, from the cities and from the agriculture. Uh, you know, this is the expansion of, 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 of our sort of inhabited area into nature. Um, so the challenge is we need to solve everything we need to solve for one, for one earthling within this area, and if we can do it for one, we can also do it for everybody else. Um, so, um, this is the amount of energy uh, uh, she, uh, that you can say that the greenhouse gas emissions comes from waste, agriculture, industrial processes, and energy. So you can see energy is the biggest one. Uh, energy is basically construction, transportation, and, and manufacturing. And, and these are the energy sources. So each of you, to sustain your share of Earth's, this is how much gas, coal, and oil is, is burned every year. Um, we can do the same with this much solar power and this much uh, offshore wind power. Uh, but then you have the intermittence problem. But a simple solution is just to double the production. So this much and this much. Uh, and then to store the double production in, uh, in batteries and in hydrogen. And the good thing about hydrogen is that you can use it as fuels, because uh, batteries are for like small electronics uh, and, and stationary things, but things that move ships, airplanes, and, 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 and a lot of other industrial processes need uh, more dense fuels. Um, 
So this is the sort of the energy answer. Then, um, then you have the other sectors, and, and agriculture is one of the, uh, one of the worst ones, because um, you have basically cows and sheep and rice fields release methane, and the methane is a much more powerful uh, greenhouse gas than, than CO2. Then when we burn our crops, which is a, a sort of a, a standard habit to sort of release the nutrients, uh, we release nitrous oxide and, 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 uh, and CO2. Um, and finally, when we replace nature uh, with, with fields, the roots and the soil uh, releases uh, carbon uh, into, into the atmosphere. So um, then another thing that's interesting is that actually all of this are crops that are used only to uh, make um, fuels, so-called energy crops. We can replace this amount of agricultural land with this amount of photovoltaics. So that's like a, a, a simple solution. Uh, then instead of burning our crops, we can actually turn the, the bio waste into, uh, into biogas. Um, and then you have sort of um, all, all the areas that, that, are, that are kept fallow. Um, instead of uh, keeping them fallow in recycling, you can actually use them for, for grazing of cattle instead, taking some of the cattle off the, um, uh, off the, the dairy farms. And that brings us to the elephant or the cow in the room, is that uh, dairy and, and beef, uh, a cow releases 100 kilos of methane uh, per year when it belches. Um, to offset that amount of methane, you would have to grow 108 trees. Um, the good news is that cows love trees. Uh, because actually, if you look at the natural habitat uh, for, for cows, uh, it's in the forests, for elephants in the savannah, for, uh, you know, like it's, it's called silvopasture, essentially when you have cattle moving along in, uh, in forests. Uh, the jamón de bellota comes from, uh, from these uh, beautiful fields. Uh, uh, the sheep in Portugal, uh, the deer in, uh, in, in Denmark. So basically, very simply, if we put all of the cattle in silvopasture, uh, polyculture of various kinds, and we replace the rest of the agriculture with best, best practice agriculture, uh, and, and, and so the good news is, you can see, this is the amount of land that, that, has, that is used for cereals uh, developing over since the, the 60s, and this is the production. So the same amount of land giving much bigger yields. So essentially, if we, if we make those two simple conversions, we can go uh, to uh, a much more compact footprint. So, so, so just like with this simple, simple math, you can see this is the amount of area that we need to sustain one earthling in a sustainable way, uh, 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 carbon neutral. Uh, and that's how much space we have. So, so anyway, like, the good news is that it's totally possible. Uh, the big question is why aren't we doing it? Um, also, the, an, another good news is that we can actually start expanding the amount of forest. Uh, we believe if we in, implement this basic thinking, we can get back to, to uh, 1900 levels where uh, uh, we have much more forest than we, than we have today. Um, of course, if you have a family of three, this is how much, if you have a village of 150. Uh, all of Denmark can be sustained sustainably uh, with this amount of land, and, and this is how it would look for the United States. Um, so, so essentially, the, the, uh, you know, and you know we, we've, been, we've been doing this work uh, at our own energy, just using available public, uh, public information. Um, but with the intent of, first for our own sake, to understand when, whenever they talk about uh, climate change and the sort of inaction of uh, our global politicians, we ask ourselves, why aren't we doing anything? And then people say, yeah, but it's not possible if, if all of Earth has to have the same uh, quality of life as the West, then uh, the, the planet can't sustain it. And, so, and suddenly people don't really know 
uh, what it takes. And then we started, this is a, a, a sketch we're making, but like essentially uh, the conversion of, of all of your household appliances into uh, electric so the sources can be renewable, uh, the, the sort of the, the best practice and the choice of materials and, and the insulation, and then trying to sort of make it accessible. What are the transformations that would need to happen at the different scales from the individual home to the kind of building scale or the, or the city block? Um, and, and in a way to try, try to sort of imagine that if the master plan for the planet or master planet could be a kind of online resource, um, maybe located in the, in the metaverse where anyone can go and intuitively understand the complexities at, at any scale they choose uh, and experience what happens when different industries convert into uh, more sustainable ones, what happens when we make agriculture more effective and free up area for, for, for more nature and, and more forests. Um, and, and essentially, at being able to zoom out at any scale from the, the metropolitan region of, of, uh, of Copenhagen uh, all the way to the scale of, uh, of the greater region of, uh, uh, of Europe, and, and do it in a way where it doesn't become abstract numbers or something that doesn't really relate to us, but because you can always zoom in, you'll be able to experience not only how possible and how practical uh, a sustainable human presence on Earth is, but also maybe how desirable and, and enjoyable it, uh, uh, it might be. So, um, uh, yeah, so, so this, is, this is work we're doing in-house now. We're, 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 we're definitely looking for, for some sponsors or collaborators to, to contribute. So if any, any of you have uh, some pesos burning in your pocket uh, or, or some ideas, please, uh, please reach out. Um, but maybe just to show that it's not, it's not an abstract academic idea. Like I've been showing this to some of the CEOs of some of the major companies in Denmark. And one of the biggest companies in Denmark is uh, Mask, the seven-pointed uh, star on a, on a blue background. Um, and trade volume is predicted to triple by 2050, and 90% of all trade goes by sea. Um, so it's expected that carbon emissions from shipping will increase optimistically 50%, but more likely 250% by 2050. So um, uh, Maersk made a commitment that the next eight super container ships will be running on methane instead of oil. And they're committed to converting the entire fleet to methane. Uh, and to do so, we need to find a source. That means that the growth in global shipping by 2050 can be offset by, um, uh, by biofuels. Uh, that means that by converting the transportation into biofuels, we can reduce the carbon emissions related to all of the products that are moved around uh, by the oceans. To do that, we need, we can also, we need a, a massive source of renewable energy. But when we have massive source of renewable energy, we can also use that energy for instance, to create uh, ammoniac for, for farming, to create methane for, uh, or methanol for, uh, for, for shipping. Um, so um, you can imagine that the industrial ports of the future are going to become knowledge hubs and green growth hubs. Um, and um, together with Mask, we looked at uh, applying this thinking to the port of Tangier in Morocco so Tangier is at the mouth of the Gibraltar, and it's essentially the gateway from the world to North Africa and, uh, and Western Europe. Um, and that strategic location, a third of all of uh, Maersk's ships come through here. So uh, we imagine that by basically having a hinterland of um, uh, 40 square kilometers of, uh, uh, of solar fields and, uh, and wind farms, we can create sort of uh, um, a, whole, a whole new sort of series of functions that you normally don't associate with, a, with an industrial port, so that uh, the port and, and the sort of um, the massive demand for biofuels ends up converting not just the port of Tangier, but the city of Tangier and the entire country of Morocco into, into renewables. Um, 
so essentially what I'm trying to say is that by, by doing the, the work on the global scale, and, and the plan is over the next couple of years, together with Mask, to take eight of their most frequented ports and turn them into these green growth hubs so that they can actually sustain their entire fleet uh, using only uh, sun and wind turned into, uh, into biofuels. And, and to give you an idea, the company Mask has a carbon footprint twice the size of all of Denmark's. So if you can turn Mask uh, renewable, it's almost like turning Denmark and Sweden renewable in a, in, in a single strike. Um, so in that sense, suddenly like applying architectural thinking at the global scale seems to be, to be productive. And then actually just, just for fun, uh, since, uh, since we are here, uh, I have one last uh, project with me, uh, which is not on Earth. If, if you thought, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, we've been spending the last couple of years working with uh, NASA uh, uh, on imagining the first uh, permanent human presence on the moon. Uh, and when you build on the moon, if you have a kilo of cement on Earth, it becomes uh, 10,000 times more expensive once you move it to the moon. So everything has to be built with in situ resource utilization. Um, we have to imagine what a lunar vernacular is going to look like. Um, just like the Inuits use the availability of ice and the insulating properties of snow. Um, uh, in, uh, in the troglodyte houses, uh, keeping the extreme cold and heat of the desert away with the thermal mass of the, of the ground. Um, on the moon, we have regolith. It's a very fine grain moon dust. Uh, apparently, it goes everywhere. The, the major issue of the Apollo astronauts pointed out was dust, dust, and dust. Um, and uh, we've been testing different ways to print with uh, moon dust. Uh, using lasers, uh, microwaves, or, uh, or, or, or a furnace. Um, and this is basically what moon dust looks like when you melt it. It becomes a kind of obsidian glass. This is some of our first tests using solar-powered lasers to turn moon dust into a kind of black glass. In Game of Thrones, they would call it dragon glass. Um, these are some other samples. So a very beautiful uh, uh, enigmatic material. Um, the first base is going to be close to the south pole of the moon. And that's because at the south pole, because the axis of the moon is parallel to the sun. So on the south pole, in the craters, you have areas that never get sunlight. So this, all the blue dots is where we know there is ice at the surface. And if you have ice, you have water. You have hydrogen, power, and you have oxygen uh, for breathing. So we need to do all these things. Um, basically, the, also, we, we choose the principle uh, because we, we want to minimize the amount of material because construction is difficult. And also, you don't want to spend energy or, uh, or oxygen. So by using a Steiner tree principle, um, we can actually reduce the amount of, of road that is necessary to travel and using circle passing, packing as a principle. We can also uh, increase proximity. So, so basically starting from, the, from the sort of ground zero, we need to make uh, launch pads to, to come and go. Uh, we need uh, solar arrays. Uh, we need a sort of in situ resource infrastructure to collect water and, and, and dust. Uh, and we need to create a permanently inhabitable uh, habitat. And that becomes the basis for this village on the edge of the, of the crater. The crater becomes almost like a, an ocean of darkness. Um, and then, of course, we have a lot of difficulty. You have uh, roughly 200 meteorites hitting the moon every year because there's no atmosphere. The meteorites don't burn, so they, they hit the ground. You have solar particle events. You have extreme temperature swings, like uh, plus and minus 150 degrees. Moon quakes, no atmospheric pressure, uh, a magnetic field that is 1% of that of Earth. So you have 100 times the amount of radiation. 
and then you have dust everywhere. Um, if you are in a sort of zero uh, atmospheric pressure, the perfect section is a circle, but with our 3D printer, we can only create an angle of 70 degrees, so we end up with, with somewhere in between. We, we measure different geometries to measure the, uh, the optimum uh, uh, form, and for a 200 square meter habitat, a donut is the perfect, uh, the perfect shape. Um, basically, we can print maximum inclination of 70 degrees um, with a hollow shell, so we, can, we don't have to laser center more than necessary. We can use regolith as an insulant. Uh, then we can actually cover it with dust on the outside, um, and because you don't have any winds, because you don't have any atmosphere, we can actually, the dust stays, you know, the footprints of, of, uh, of Armstrong are still uh, visible on, on, the, on the moon. The dust is also a great protection from uh, meteorites, uh, as well as from um, insulating from, uh, from radiation. Uh, we imagine that maybe we could make these shelves that could hold the, the dust. Um, uh, then you have a liquid membrane on the inside. Uh, we sort of optimize the geometry to swallow the... Uh, the, the outward pressure of the pressure differential. And then the shelves actually serve as, as ribs, uh, like a rib shell um, on the outside. So we, we know these shapes from, uh, from, from large span constructions, typically on the inside. Um, but by putting them on the outside, we can actually deposit the moon dust into them uh, and it stays. So it's kind of interesting. This is a, a 3D printed model from the office, and it's made exactly the same way that we would build the, the real building. Um, so essentially, you, you send the moon lander. Uh, it deploys. Uh, it's a central pivot uh, 3D printer, because with a single fixed point, you have the greatest predictability uh, of the environment. Then you have the little drones that collect dust to the, to the printer. Uh, we bring very few elements from home, uh, these kind of common birthing mechanisms for the entrances and a single window, and we use those three elements to, to create the bridge for the rest of the, of the, of the habitat. Then we send in a drone with a liquid applied membrane that makes it uh, uh, perfectly sealed. Um, and then the courtyard can be turned into uh, a satellite disk or a, 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 a sort of quantum computing farm or an actual farm uh, or a central pivot of, of photovoltaics because the sun is always coming at a very low angle. If you have a vertical axis uh, uh, photovoltaic, you can actually have 97% daylight uh, during the year. So, so we like this idea that by, by sticking strictly to these very hard, almost, not, if not scientific, then very sort of deductive uh, methods, we can actually discover an architecture and a language that, that feels uh, almost like a, the beginning of a lunar tradition. Um, also, the, the best example we had of a similar habitat is the ISS. This is what the ISS looks like in principle. And that's what it looks like in reality. Uh, of course, all these different elements of the daily life on an astronaut. And these are some of the guidelines from NASA to avoid uh, people getting cabin fever. Long lines of sight, generous head height, view of the sunshine, view of natural elements, visual connection to Earth, uh, and privacy. Um, so we designed basically two, uh, the two uh, locks separate two halves, two astronauts in, in each. So if one of them fails, they can escape over into the, into the other one. Uh, then you have the liquid membrane, spring-loaded uh, uh, division walls, and flat-packed furniture. Um, also, you can actually jump three times higher on the moon, so having a tall ceiling height is probably a good idea if you sneeze. Um, you can see the texture of the 3D printing on the, on the inside. Uh, this is the airlock. Uh, and then maybe one last thing. This is the schedule of an astronaut. Um, they go outside in various ways. But the one thing they always do is they sleep eight hours per day. Uh, and if we insulate their bedroom 
with water. So essentially all of the water storage is located in the walls of the bedroom. Uh, hydrogen is a great shield against radiation. Uh, we can actually massively lower the amount of radiation exposure. Um, then of course, uh, one day on the moon is a month. So it's dark for 14 days and then it's light for 14 days. So we need to simulate the circadian cycles to, to keep the astronauts uh, sane. So during the day, the, the color and warmth uh, of the light changes uh, just like it would do outside. Um, and maybe finally we have the Earth Lounge. Because the moon is always facing Earth in the same direction, the, moon, the Earth is always sitting on the same place in the sky. Uh, so the Earth Lounge, you always have a view of Earth. Um, So we made a little, uh, a little video trying to capture the atmosphere sort of, of what it would feel like for the first four Earthlings living on the edge of the Sea of Loneliness on the South Pole of the Moon. And then, of course, like we're actually working for another company trying to look a little bit further. Once we go further, we want to move into caves. We're going to become cavemen again. There's lava tubes on the moon that are 30 kilometers long, 500 meters wide, and, uh, and several hundred meters tall. And, and of course, in, in those, you can, you can imagine completely different uh, uh, elements. But the funny thing is, a lot of the challenges that we have to face when imagining uh, yeah, one of the cool things on, on the moon is basketball is, uh, is for everybody, suddenly. Um, but, um, but also, I, I, I love this idea that, um, that a lot of the technologies, we can see it already with, um, with Icon, the company we've been developing, the 3D printing techniques, is that because it's going to be so difficult and so demanding to build on the moon, we have to make the technology much more automated, much more refined, much more effective and precise and efficient uh, than we have to on Earth. But by developing that technology, the printers that we have, the printing technology that we get here on Earth becomes so much better. So now with the same company, we're also working on, um, on actually doing um, uh, uh, an affordable village for 50 people in the Yucatan, uh, essentially using technology that we're working with NASA to develop for the moon, but it can actually become a very affordable answer for affordable housing uh, back here on Earth. So, so somehow I like the idea that even sometimes the question is like, wh why are you so obsessed with um, you know, these extreme cases when we have so many real problems? But the funny thing is sometimes to solve a very large, easy problem, if you can solve a much more difficult, small problem, that becomes a much more scalable solution for the, for the, for the very large and easy problem. Um, so in that sense, I, I'm also like very inspired by this, day, this idea that maybe 10 years from now, you can go out and look at the, the night sky and you can see a little glimpse of human presence uh, on, uh, uh, on, on the surface of the moon. That, that's, um, that definitely feels like one aspect of, uh, of giving form to the future.
excelente.